Hello, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Merle Massey. I'm the coordinator for undergraduate research at the University of Saskatchewan. And our session today, and we're recording this one in August of 2021, is on how to make a research poster. I am both presenting this session and running the session. So if you do have a question, uh, hopefully you can pop it into the chat and I'll find it as we go along. But let's go ahead. As a settler Canadian of Scottish, Irish, Norwegian, Swedish, and Ukrainian tradition, I am filled with gratitude to live within Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. I give respect to the First Nations and Métis of this place and continually value our interconnectedness through Wakutuwin. I too love this that land of vast skies and tall trees, Saskatoons and blueberries, and the swift and slow waters of the Saskatchewan River. That is my land acknowledgement that I built uh, with the Gwena Moss Centre at the University of Saskatchewan. If you have a chance to take their course on building your own land acknowledgement, I do recommend it. So my first question is, and I do want you to put your answers in the chat. Have you ever created a research poster? Is this something that you've done before? Uh, is this something that's new for you? Let me know in the chat. So thanks very much for that and, and to let us know. So we have a bit of a mix. We've got quite a few old hands at this. So whether you've done it in class or whether you've done it as, a, as part of your research work, but there are a few newbies around. So I'm glad to have you along with us for the ride. And I'm going to lean on uh, my more practiced crew to uh, on some of the answers as we go along. So these are some of the things that we're gonna think about after today. And these are some of your takeaways. So the first is one big thing and we will get to that, but it's a way to focus your post and to really identify what it is if you if the people talking to you or that you're talking to remember one thing about your poster what is that one thing you want them to remember also your context what is the context that's where we're going to start and your audience who's listening to your poster plain language how we're going to be able to take this down to a way that you can talk to as many people as possible and that they'll understand you the first time that you explain it. One of the things that I talk about quite a lot is that the whole process of writing a poster is actually thinking, it's actually analysis. People tend to think of it as something that we do at the end, but writing is thinking and thinking is analysis. Good visuals, we'll talk a little bit about that. Those of you who had a chance to, to visit, have a, be part of our session last week, it was recorded around infographics and data visualization. Good visuals matter. And a few design tips that we have and how to present with poise. And that's whether you're going to be recording your session, which you are if you're part of the Shure Symposium, uh, or if you're going to be presenting live. So these are some of the things to think about. And you notice how I started with one big thing and then moved back up to context and went, that's a very deliberate choice on my part. So this is actually the, how we're going to go about it. But the, even if all you get out of this is one big thing, that's the one thing I want you to remember. So things to think about after today. First of all, why are you creating your poster? What's your context? So this is the first thing that I want you to think about before you even put pen to paper, but why are you creating the poster? Some of you are going to be making a poster because you're asked to do it for a class. Um, Biomedical Science 210, for example, does a poster session every year. So and sometimes you're making it for a class to be marked. If that's the case, do think about your audience as being part of uh, your, so your context for your class and, and that you're going to be judged by your class, you're probably going to be marked on it. Are you making the poster for a USASC or a local conference, such as the Shure Undergraduate Symposium that's coming up at the end of August? Are you making it for a regional conference, a national Canadian conference? Are you making it for an international conference? The way I present my work if I'm presenting at USASC versus if I'm presenting at an international conference is quite different. Often, especially if I'm doing uh, any of my presentations, which I'm a historian by profession, I talk about Saskatchewan history, I talk a lot about Saskatchewan geography. So when I'm presenting to an international audience, I like to make sure that they know that, that they have an understanding of the space and the place that I'm talking about. So do think about why you're making the poster and who you're, who you're making it for. 
Another thing that students sometimes forget is it's really important to be clear what stage of research you're at. Sometimes your poster is just your literature review. You haven't actually started conducting any of the research. Maybe maybe that's that's all that you're going to be presenting in your poster. But you need to showcase what's what stage you're at. Maybe you've just done your your or or you're in the middle of connect collecting your data, but you haven't actually had a chance to analyze it. Or you've collected and you've analyzed the data, but you've discovered a big hole, you can still create a research poster that gives you that snapshot of exactly what stage of research you're at. And as long as you're clear, that's a perfectly acceptable time to do a poster. So you don't have to be actually finished a project to create a poster. So I want to be very clear on that. The next is which is more important, how smart you sound or how much your audience understands. And I'm going to pause and you guys can tuck that one into the chat. Which is more important, how smart you sound or how much your audience understands? Audience will understand. You guys are really getting it. How much your audience understands? I'll take B for 200. Audience, it is absolutely audience. Although I have to tell you that if you are an undergraduate student and you're doing a poster for a class and you're trying to sound smart and get a good mark, I can understand if you thought that that was a good answer because it's not necessarily a bad answer, but here's the secret. The easier your professor can understand what you're trying to say, your professor or your audience, the easier your audience understands what you say, that's actually where you want to be. How much your audience understands will automatically make you sound smart. So definitely audience for 200, thanks very much. So what is a research poster? Both of these pictures, so of course nowadays because of COVID uh, and frankly for international competitions or national uh, uh, poster sessions, we're going more and more online. And so the chances of you presenting online, even as we move back to our pre-COVID level of, of uh, engagement, uh, the chances of you presenting online are still quite high. Our SURE Symposium at the end of August is still online. But the picture on the right actually comes from the SURE poster session that we had in 2019 um, in the summer, at the end of summer in 2019. That's in Convocation Hall at the University of Saskatchewan. So uh, we have had poster sessions on campus. We will be having more. We're hoping to have one at the end of uh, November, beginning of December for anyone who's taking honors or, or research classes and, and to get that organized. So research posters are, are often, they're two things. They're both a cap a capture of your research, but they're also part of a larger event, a conference, a one-day conference, a two-day conference, a three-day conference. And it's this focused opportunity to give that snapshot of where you're at in your research. So that's what a research poster is. It's both your research and it's a chance to network with other people and learn from other people. So here's what a research poster is. It's a visual presentation. It's very much visual. Of course, when you're doing it online, in which you will be for the SURE Symposium, it's also audio. So you do have that component as well. It's kind of like an advertisement for your work. You're advertising what you did. It's that very quick 30 second to one minute kind of snapshot. Even though you're going to have more time than that to explain what you did, it still becomes an advertisement. You're not going to take them through four months or eight months or 12 months of research. It's short, very, very short. It's your one big thing. Think really hard, and we'll get to this again in a minute, but your one big thing is, is the one takeaway that you want people to remember about your research work. A poster is visual because it helps you explain your story. Whatever your research story is, your poster helps you explain it. So you are an essential and integral component of your research poster. Very few research posters stand on their own and can be just read. Like oftentimes they're, they're put up on the wall outside your faculty member, your supervisor's office. At, but really how often have you stood there and read one of those posters? Be honest. Um, they're visuals to help you explain your story. So it's it's both. So the process of creating a poster is an analytical tool. And I see I need to work on my on my uh, things that that are popped up. But actually, these two go to go together. The process of creating a poster, of sitting down and actually writing the text that's going to go on the poster, is an analytical tool because first you have to explain it to yourself and kind of like, oh yeah. 
ah, that's what I did and that's why I did it and this is what happened. So you're building that story for yourself, but it also becomes a way for you to tell other people about it. What it's not is a whole journal article or a whole essay just splashed onto a slightly larger piece of paper. I often get asked in the poster sessions, well, that I, our discipline uses larger poster sizes than that because I always limit poster sizes when it's, a, when it's an in-person poster session and you have to print your poster. But the reason for that is that just making a larger piece of paper on the wall just means that they've shoved more text in. It doesn't mean that you're going to remember it any better. It doesn't mean that it's actually any better research. They're just trying to put more words on a larger piece of paper. But that's what a poster is not. It's not a whole essay or a whole journal article just on a big piece of paper. It's also not a bunch of small graphics that no one can understand. Never assume that people know what a scatter plot is or, or a box plot. I'm a historian. I never took any statistics math uh, or or advanced calculations of any kind and I have a PhD and I'm an award-winning author so don't assume that your audience understands graphics graphics are a specialized tool and you have to do them well and we'll talk about that quite well the other thing to remember it's that people sometimes think that a poster is just your results but it's not and that's why in the last slide you'll you'll notice that I said that you can do a research poster at any stage of your process as long as you're very clear in your poster what stage of the process that you're at and the reason for that is that a poster is not just your results it's about what's your research question what's your process what were your methods and what were your results if you've got that far you don't necessarily have to but just to remember that just focusing on your results isn't the only way to give a research poster nor is it the only thing that your audience is interested in it's also not just written up at the end of the project. It's part of the project the whole way along. And going back to what a research poster is, the process of creating a poster or the process of creating a journal article, the writing process is an analytical tool. So you can't just conduct all your research and you hear this, particularly in the sciences, you'll hear faculty members say this, ah, I just took six weeks at the end to write it up. Well, the writing of it is actually where you come to understand what you did. And so the, if you start that all the way along, um, you're gonna have a much better, much more cohesive, clear and understandable project. So having said all of this, what do you want to say versus what your audience wants to know? Which of these two is more important? And you go ahead and answer in the chat. What's more important? What do you want to say or what does your audience want to know? <laughs> and of course, yeah, so we get the responses are saying it's a little bit of both and it is to a certain extent because after all, you still have your research story to share. But when it comes to your audience, the more you think about your audience, not so much what you want to say, but what your audience wants to know. They're actually the same thing. They're two sides of the same coin, because after all, you have to have a research project to tell them about. That's number one. But your audience, what does your audience want to know? What are the sticking points? What are the big picture items that your audience will get the most bang for their buck? That's where you want to focus the most of your energy. It's the same thing, it's two sides of the same coin, but if you think about it primarily from the audience's perspective, you'll have a slightly stronger poster. So how do we go about that? Does audience change a poster? Yes, it absolutely does. If you're doing a poster for a class, you do need to follow what it says in the syllabus. Don't be rogue and do something completely different. If you're doing a poster for a class, what does the syllabus say? What does the rubric say? Poster for an in-person event. That's really specific because it's how appealing is your poster. Will people stop? And so the visual aspects of your poster matter more in an in-person event than they do online. But a poster for online also matters. Can people read it on their laptop or is it too small? If they have to keep zooming in and moving around to different parts of your poster, that can be a problem as well. If they really have to zoom because your writing is too small, that's something to think about as well. So a good, good process in this is to make sure that you're looking at it whole screen on your poster and taking a look at it both really up close and further back.
And in all cases, who's listening to you? Who's reading your poster? Are you being marked or judged? What's the rubric? Are there prizes? These are these are things to think about as well. And that's just being practical. I mean, in, it, if you're a student, if you're an undergraduate student, chances are you are being marked or judged. Uh, and if there are being, oh, if you are being judged, what did you get a chance to look at the rubric for those of you who are entered in the sure symposium we will be posting the judges rubric on that canvas site so once you've accepted your invitation to the canvas site uh, we will be posting the judges rubric so you will get a chance to see what the judges are watching for so as 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 banal as that sounds audience does change a poster but this is where i want you to start when you sit down to think about and, and write your and write out the words that are going to go on your poster, I want you to think about this as a personal journey. How does the research resonate with you? Why are you doing this work? Why were you intrigued by this work? Why were you intrigued to work with your professor? What's your professor working on that really resonates with you? What's the larger goal of the research? Where is the research going? These are some of the things that I want you to start with when you sit down to do your poster because your audience will be interested in that. They don't want to necessarily dive straight in to the research and the ins and outs and the technicalities of the research. Give them that one sentence that, that tells them why you got interested in this work. What does this work mean to you? What's your personal journey? So that's part of it. Okay, now what's the one big thing that you want people to know? So here's here, if, if you take nothing else out of this presentation, this is where I want you to think. What is your one big thing? And I've, I've tried to break it down, and this actually comes from Mike Morrison and his better posters, and, and we'll talk about that in a couple of minutes. But the one big thing can be all kinds of things in, in, in terms of your research. For some of you, your one big thing might be theory. You might be making really, really big inroads in theory. This is more, this applies more to say social science uh, or humanities. You might be working on a new particular theory. In my work as a historian, sometimes that's where I live. And I'm actually allergic to theory, but uh, yeah, it's just not, it doesn't really resonate with me. But at the same time, uh, it, it can be an aspect uh, and, the, and the biggest part of your research. So do keep that in mind. Another area that, that people tend to sort of gloss over, they think about it as, as being sort of just a technical aspect of their poster, but sometimes your one big thing might be in your methods. It might be something that you're doing that's really, really innovative or interesting in your methodology. You might be using a new particular computer program. You might be using a computer program in a new way, in a new discipline that hasn't been used that way before. You might have actually built a whole new measuring uh, uh, component. Um, I just finished a a, a uh, book uh, about a scientist at the University of Saskatchewan by the name of Sylvia Fedoric. And her work was very much groundbreaking because of the methodology. They, they actually built a brand new machine, the Cobalt Bomb, the Cobalt 60 machine at the University of Saskatchewan. And her work was part of a research team that, that not only built this machine from the ground, it's used for, for radiation, uh, for cancer therapy. And uh, it's still being used around the world today. It was built in at the U of S in the late 1940s, early 1950s. But Sylvia's research, um, yes, that was me. <laughs> um, that research work uh, that she did, she was published in both science and nature as, as a graduate student, as a master's student, because her work was so cutting edge because of their methodology, because they were actually built and then measured a whole new machine. And so sometimes your methods actually are your big your one big thing sometimes it's your results most of us are here on the bottom left thinking about results and your results are oftentimes the one thing that people want to know the the one elephant in the room is an intervention now an intervention is something like everybody needs to eat 10 goji berries every day and you'll never get cancer that's an intervention. So that would be a finding. That's a result that comes out of your work, but it leads to an intervention. Now, of course, I'm making that one up. Um, yeah, could I share that research? Yeah, that's not actually a true thing. I'm just making that one up. But that's an example of, of, of you You might be sitting, working at cutting edge, re, cutting edge research to the point where there actually is an intervention of some kind. And this can be in social sciences as well. An intervention in that case would be something like some of the research that I've seen from undergraduate students in the last couple of years would be things like um, 
babies who uh, are born addicted to drugs because their 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 mother was had an addiction problem babies who are born addicted to drugs actually do better in a small uh, setting in a household setting where they get a lot of physical love and care rather than a in a clinical setting where they tend to get even more drugs to combat the drugs that they're that they're addicted to and so that's an intervention it's both a finding that came out, came out of some undergraduate research that i've seen at the us in the past year but it's also an intervention it lets it it lets us know that that there's a better way to handle babies young young infants who are born with an addiction so that's an intervention so that gives you an actual example so think about that think about your one big thing and think about what's the one thing about your research that people will be most interested in because it has had the most impact so that's your one big thing that you the one thing that you want people to remember about what you've done all right when I was in high school in Saskatoon at Evan Hardy, one of my English professors had this massive um, sign on the wall said "Eschew obfuscation. And we all had to go and look it up because what the hell does that mean? Eschew means, means throw away and obfuscation means you're deliberately making things unclear. So basically what we do in academia, um, where we use big words because we think that big words make us sound smart and we want to get our stuff published. However, there is a huge counter movement to that around plain language. Plain language is stronger, not weaker than academic language. What plain language is, and we have a whole session that came from Jill McMillan. So if you have a chance to, to watch that session from Jill, she's the graduate writing specialist at the U of S. She breaks down plain language and gives you some examples of things that you can do in your own writing uh, to take your, your work from academic language to plain language. The reason why we want plain language is that you want people to understand what you've said the first time they've read it. I don't know about you guys, but I have read way too many journal articles where I've read the same paragraph five times and I still don't know what the hell they said, right? So um, keep that up, apologies for the, for the um, um, word choices that I've been making. But plain language also really helps if, if the, you're, you have to assume that your audience your language that you're writing in may not be your audience's first language. So using plain language will reach a much broader audience. And in academia, you want to reach as broad an audience as you can. You want the most number of people to reference you as you can. And so the, if you use plain language, those are the most cited articles, always. The articles that people can understand the first time they read them are always the most cited articles. So plain language is not dumbing it down. It's about making your academic writing clear and understandable for everyone the first time that they read it. So that's something that you really think about. This is my own little personal um, uh, soapbox that writing is an analytical tool. So when you sit down to write out the text that's going to go on your poster. And it doesn't matter if you do it in a, in a Word document first and try and cut it down, or if you do it right in a, in a template, in a, in a poster template and just work on each section individually. That doesn't matter how you choose to do it. But writing itself is an analytical tool. This is about questioning. This is about finding the points where you agree or disagree. So you can agree with what you've done. You can disagree with what you've done. You can agree with what other people have done. You can disagree with that, what other people have done. You can feel free to criticize, criticize yourself, criticize other people. You can reflect, you can analyze, you can summarize, you can connect to other things. So learning how to connect the dots, be really self-reflective. You can understand, figure, see your problems. You can see your gaps. When you sit down to write, this is a critical analytical tool you write to discover and to understand and the soon as and when you understand it for yourself the better you understand it for yourself the easier it is for you to explain it to someone else so a whole poster no more than 250 to 300 words max less is better i'm going to talk about the technicalities uh, a few slides down but do keep that in mind Shorter is actually better. Now you can go too short. Try not to go too short. You still have to have enough information in there to actually explain yourself, but not so many that you're using weasel words or you're using um, 
passive voice or using anything that makes it sound like um, like it wasn't you who did the research. So that's that's another thing to think about too. The voice and the tone that you use in a research poster is a little bit different than in a journal. And it's also different again when you go to do the oral presentation to explain your poster. We'll, excuse me, we'll talk about that in a second. So Albert Einstein said, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. This is a classic, classic. There's another that said, I'm sorry I've written you such a long letter. I didn't have time to write you a short letter. And I always thought that that was really, really interesting because it flips the whole dynamic. But what they're really saying is that to write short and concise actually takes more work. So what I recommend and I hope that you've had a chance to do this all along, but write as soon as you start researching because it takes longer to make a clear, short and excellent poster. So this, having this session today, August 4th, our presentation is starts on August 25th. They are due August 23rd. So that gives you almost 20 days, um, which is quite a bit, hopefully. Give yourself time. So you're not doing it the night before. Please don't do it the right before. We do have a writing retreat next week. It's Wednesday and Thursday. We have multiple sessions. They're 90 minutes each. So even if you can only commit to one 90 minute session, I do recommend it. Giving yourself that set aside piece of time that you know that you're going to concentrate on your writing. And these are, these are facilitated sessions. So we are going to ask students in each of those 90 minute sessions, okay, what's your goal for this session? You might say, my goal for this session is to write the conclusion for my poster, or I'm gonna write the methods section for my poster in this 90 minute time. And, and, and remembering that you're writing, uh, in those writing retreats, you're writing drafts, not finals, but it could be, maybe you already have a draft and you're gonna use the writing retreat to cut it down a little bit, or you're going to use the writing retreat to polish it. When you give yourself that focused bit of writing time, your writing will actually improve. Then, of course, edit. Edit, 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 proofread, proofread, read it out loud. Ask someone else to read it for you. Uh, these, are, these are all really, really good things. Um, planning it out. Here's the thing. Whenever I do a poster, sometimes I'll figure out what sections I want and then I will take a poster board and I'll take post-it notes and I'll actually, you know, figure out where I want to put things and what I want it to look like. You can use poster paper. You can actually start doing it on, on whatever you're going to use. Most of you are probably going to be using PowerPoint, but there are a few other options as well. So you can plan. But here's the other thing. It isn't just about your texts. It's also about your visuals, and that's what I want to talk about next. So it's about gathering your visuals and figuring out what are the visuals that you're going to put in. Because good visual design matters, and it probably matters more on a poster than it does on almost any other kind of academic writing that you'll do. So your graphics, your charts, your figures, any images that you choose, the consistency, the text, all of that actually matters. So good visual design is an integral part of a poster. So you want to aim for a unified look. And on the left, you'll see there's a real lack of consistency because there's, there's various fonts. They're using different shape styles, white border, black border, white text, black text. They're all over the place. And this is this, um, I'm sorry that you can't see it, but it comes from uh, info diagram. That's where the image comes from. This tells the same thing, but it aims for that more unified look. In this particular case, they're talking about strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, so SWAT. When you take a look at these, you can see that there's, there's, there's differences in, in how we perceive the images. One of the things that I've done, if anyone ever goes back and watches the video from last summer, I, ha I did a presentation on how to do a poster, uh, how to do a research poster last summer, and this was where I fell down the worst. I did not have a unified look at all. There was absolutely nothing unified. I was all over the map. It was visually a mess. And so when I went back in in October and, and redid it, that's one of the things that I really thought about was a unified look. And this applies not just to research posters, but any kind of presentation that you're giving. Try to make sure that if you're using a particular color scheme, if you're using a particular, if you're um, a particular program to generate your graphics, make sure you use the same program to generate all of your graphics if you can. So aim for a unified look. Um, Pictures are, for the most part, better than words, most of the time. 
not all the time. If you've got really complex charts or, uh, or graphics that you have to explain, then maybe think of if there's another way to explain or a different chart or a graphic that, uh, or diagram that you can use. I'm not a scientist, so I don't necessarily understand things like scatter plots and box plots. I always need them to be explained to me. Pie charts are the worst um, thing that you can use. They, you, they, they um, work in some cases, but very, very few people use way more part pie charts than what they should. Uh, bar graphs are quite good, but again, you want that unified look. If any of you are doing uh, graphics and charts, the two things that I want you to do, number one, please do watch the presentation in Sure in our Sure YouTube page on data visualization and infographics, uh, because the, the presenter gave a lot of really, really good information around, uh, around how to make graphics work for you. So that's number one. Number two, those of you who are University of Saskatchewan students, you can access LinkedIn Learning. Uh, through the University of Saskatchewan Library. And there are a number of very short courses, hour, hour and 15 minutes, around good graphics and design. And I do recommend them, especially if you're new to graphics and design. It gives you some ideas of how to do it well. I'm a historian, so pictures are always part of what I do. Pictures always help tell a story. So this is Mastahi Makwa, that's Big Bear, he's in the center. Um, uh, with the black and white striped hat and he's got uh, he's wearing stripes. This is trading at Fort Pitt in 1884. When you post a picture, try to always say where your source is. In fact, you always have to. This is part of citation. You have to cite images and graphics and diagrams. And just to go back in terms of graphics and diagrams, you might be creating your own graphics and diagrams, but you also could potentially be using someone else's. And if you are using someone else's, make sure that you do good citations and you say exactly where it came from. So good things to think about. Now, words are still necessary. I chose to leave this one still pink. I'm sorry, I am moving away from my graphic design lesson that I just uh, taught you. I just, I couldn't make it a different color. But text sizes, so think about, so this is a, a bit of an overview. Title, no smaller than 85 point. Your authors, you know, the, sort of your um, subtitles, subheadings, that gives you some sizes. Captions, 18 points. I like 24, but it just depends. Um, there are certain things that you can do in a poster. Some things have to be bigger, some things can be smaller. If you are choosing to put citations on your poster, those can be really tiny because generally um, that's what people who are really, really interested and really invested in your particular area of research, they'll be interested in, in that. Uh, but your, your general audience or even uh, an audience of interested people who might be more or less in your particular realm, they won't be necessarily reading all of your um, citations. However, having said that, people are always interested in who funded you. So make sure that your funding or the funding for your larger lab uh, is recognized somewhere on your poster. So don't forget your funders. Font choices. Take a look at the fonts on the left versus the fonts on the right. On the left is serif fonts and then sans serif fonts. Those are good for headings and presentations, particularly online. So serif fonts, you'll find newspapers are serif fonts. Uh, and anything that you read at usually journal articles, but people are moving after we uh, got computers, we have more sans serif fonts. And uh, so these are some options around fonts. And I do, um, recommend that you pay attention to any guidelines of the poster. Sometimes the poster session will give you particular guidelines um, over what fonts you need and what sizes. So do follow those guidelines if there are any. If there aren't, just choose something that you think is easy to read. For the most part, especially if you're doing an, if your poster is going to be read online, I suggest a sans serif font. So a Calibri, Arial, Lucida, something like that. All right. We're going to take a look at some poster examples because I want you to think through 
what you like and what you don't like. And I really recommend that you take just Google research posters on the internet and take a look at research posters in your area of expertise. Take a look at what other people have done, what you like and what you don't like. But that's what we're going to do next. So I would like you to comment in the chat what you like and what you don't like about this particular poster, a large scale public library renovation in Taiwan. Now, recognizing that there's only so much that you can see, um, but thinking through what you like and don't like about this particular poster. I'm going to pause the recording while you guys have a chance to think and comment. So some of the comments, all the colors are chaotic. It makes it very busy. The color scheme, the lack of contrast in colors, uh, white font is a dislike. Absolutely. The um, background is not good. White color fonts and yeah, there is a flow chart in the top right and that's very good. So there are good things about this poster too, but yes, the text is very small and it's hard to read. So let's go to the next one. What do you like and not like? This one is a classic. Uh, it gets shown a lot uh, in, in uh, research poster sessions. I found it as an example of a bad scientific poster, but those of us who uh, grew up watching The Muppet Show, um, uh, prime 90s, this is prime 90s, pigs in space. Uh, so Colin, we really like your theme, or at least I do, uh, is very 90s vibe, it's true. Uh, <laughs> but there's, uh, again, comment specifically around what you like and what you don't like about the poster, and I'm going to pause again. Colin really hits it out of the park when it when it's the theme, pigs in space. That's literally what he's talking about is zero gravity and weight gain in pigs in space in zero gravity. So he hits that out of the park, absolutely. A couple of the things that to think about again, that white text on a darker background, so that can be a little bit problematic uh, to read. Uh, another thing you might notice is that it's hard to figure out where you should read first. You don't know what you should read first. You, you can't necessarily read it left to right, top to bottom with all the boxes, it's a little bit all over the place. And so uh, yeah, it is it is a little bit perhaps more wordy. It's boring. Ah, that's, the structure of the boxes is, is pretty problematic. It's true. Okay, so here we go to the next one. If you can read this, you must be nocturnal. What do you like and not like about this poster? And again, I'm gonna pause. Go ahead and put things in the chat. Really great comments in the chat. The bright red line makes me look at the line and nothing else. Uh, although I like Vanessa, you said the title drew me in. If you can read this, you must be nocturnal. Absolutely, that does actually give you a really important overview, but I agree. There's a lack of color contrast between the text and the background. It is definitely hard to read. It's built that way, so it, it does actually serve the larger purpose and the pictures are cool, uh, but it is, it, it, it White font might have made this better and contrast the red lines, so there's definitely some options. You can see the titles quite clearly, which is good, but yes, reading the text itself is quite impossible. Um, res uh, results and methods boxes, uh, methods and materials, uh, yeah, two boxes for methods and materials, yeah, so that's that's definitely a, an interesting one. There's, yeah, so there's there's some good things and definitely some not good things about this. Here's another example. This is the last example, I think. That's a really good question. It, the images are to scale or super blown up. Most of these are hard to read. It's true. If we've been pulling it off the internet uh, over time, the, it's, they are going to be harder for, for you to read. So if you're actually interested in Nebraska's agricultural landscape, the effect of local landscape composition and geographic location, I recommend that you find this one uh, on the internet and see and see if you can read it. Yeah, it's a little bit too small. There's just, I'm just going to too much too much white space. Is there such a thing as too much white space? I'm not sure that I agree with that one. Um, but Benita suggested too much white space. Um, I, the boxes are numbered, which is sort of helpful, but I find the flow is a bit problematic. Yes, the 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 I do agree though with the debt that the text is very small, uh, and even if you blow it up, it's still really really hard to read. Even if you tried to find it on the internet, so these are some of the things to think about. Is that if you if you have um, if you can look at it full scale, and then if you go back, yeah, you could have the best poster ever, but we're seeing a 240 pixel version. It will look awful either way. It's true. 
but what I'm wanting you to look at right now is just design, not the actual uh, bits and pieces of the poster. So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Garrett. Oh, there was one more. Okay, here's the fish one. Snoot growth and habitats, differing aortic, abiotic variability. Again, what you like, what you don't like. Jada finds the background distracting. There's some interesting things going on with organization. There are lots of images. The methodology might be a little bit too short, uh, so maybe we can't necessarily understand it. Although the methodology does have one, two, and three, and four, which is good, so you can kind of follow exactly how they went through it. Boundaries between title and paragraphs. Yeah, that's a good point too. If you find that you like a little bit more structure, then that's something that you should know. Boring images. Well, and, and there you go. I find that I would like the images to be larger. I'm having trouble seeing them. Background might be better if the text was in white boxes. The background suits the topic. Yeah, that's a good point. So from a design point of view, they might have put the the objective and the results, the text in boxes and maybe just left the background uh, simply because you are talking about fish and water. So there's some good design aspects to that as well. So thanks very much everyone for kind of, you know, giving you some ideas. I do recommend it though, that you go on the internet, take a look at what you like and what you don't like for posters. Because the other thing about posters is that they are very individual. Um, a couple of minor things to think about is that some, these are all, I've chosen all posters uh, that were in uh, landscape. Actually, no, this one's portrait, um, but, so, uh, but some are some portrait or landscape. That'll depend a little bit on how you want to, to do things. And so that's another thing to think about as well, which way you want to do it. Okay. so. I'm not going to show this video, but I do recommend that if you get a chance, please go ahead and do it. So there's a guy by the name of Mike Morrison. He has two presentations. His first one, Better Posters Generation 1, caused a massive stir, particularly in the science community, because Mike has, is, has been leading a movement to create um, very, very different research posters. And I recommend that you take a chance to, they're about 20 minutes each, but they are worth your time. So check out Better Posters, Mike Morrison, and watch them. And if you don't mind, please watch them both because he himself has learned. So his first one was very, very basic. It's this huge block in the middle with your one big thing. And then all the text is very, very small on the side. His second generation is a little bit more of a hybrid. It's kind of going back to to more images and and um, just a little bit more visually appealing research posters. So even even Mike himself has made some some design changes, but still they're well worth your time. So I do recommend them, but I'm not going to do them now because we'll get slammed by YouTube for for doing someone else's YouTube within our session. So we're not going to do that, but I do recommend it. So. Technicalities, software. Most of you will be using Microsoft PowerPoint, I would assume. If you need templates, if you're looking for templates, they have been moved. They were just on, on the open internet on the regular session, but now they're on pause. So there is a channel on pause called Marketing and Communications, and there are templates that are research poster templates that already have things like the USASC logo and things like that already embedded on them, so that's very handy. Some of you might be using Adobe Illustrator or Adobe InDesign. There are a number of YouTube videos around all of these things. There are a number of YouTube videos around using PowerPoint to create a research poster, Adobe InDesign to use a research poster. So YouTube is absolutely your friend. So whichever one you're going to be using, go and search YouTube and search whatever it is, PowerPoint research posters and watch those and watch a couple of those YouTube videos. High recommend. For templates, this Google is your friend. If you want to use the USAC templates, the link is there. So again, it's on pause and then search marketing and communications. But there are a number of uh, other templates out there, some of which are free, some of which are paid. If you're like me, when I was a, a student, I was looking for free. And so yeah, check them out and, and you can download some other templates. That's where Google is absolutely your friend. Now, we had a discussion in the chat around white space. White space is important. It helps your poster breathe. 
and it helps your poster sing. If you present a whole wall of text and images and you've crammed stuff into every single corner of your poster, you're freaking your audience out. If they look at your poster and they're like, oh, this is a good visual poster. I can see everything. I can understand how it's laid out. They don't actually notice the white space. What they notice is that they can breathe and they can read. They have the time and the space to read your poster. That's the key. So white space is your friend. Here are a few rules. They're not hard and fast rules, but these are some general rules. No more than 250 to 300 words max on the whole poster. Most of you will have professors who will tell you that's way not even close to enough. But if you can try and argue with them and get your stuff down, and this is where some of that, that plain writing will come in. If you can take each sentence down from 10 words to 7 words, you're going to and, and say the same thing within that sentence. Every time you can do that, you are going to end up with fewer words on your poster and easier to read. 20% text, 40% figures, 40% white space. Now, that depends on what you do. I'm a historian, so I tend to have a little bit more text, or instead of figures, I use pictures. But that 40% white space is honestly where you are aiming. And it seems high, but believe me, it's not. Simple, consistent color scheme. Don't be all over the map and try and, you know, grab attention over here and grab attention over there. You're just going to freak out your audience and they're going to run. So keep a very simple, consistent color scheme, three to four colors at most for the whole thing. The higher resolution graphs, images, figures, and pictures um, that you can use, the better. So spend, if you are creating graphs, images, or figures, use the highest re resolution you can use something like canva or just don't just use excel if you can if you can you take your information and and put it into uh, another program there are a number of programs on the internet many of which are free that will create some really really beautiful graphics for you but if you are going to create some graphics make sure that you're using the same program to create all your graphics if you can because that will give you um, a whole a better finished image and, and, and more cohesion. Uh, no background pictures or gradients behind the text. Now, a lot of you noticed that say that water one or the pigs in space one, having the image behind sort of in the background of the poster, that can be very, very effective. Where it's really problematic is if you if you don't gray that out or, or white that out right behind your text. Make sure that your text can pop. So really pay attention to your text. Information in, in our Western culture, which most of you will be sharing your work in, information flows left to right and top to bottom. So whether you're putting it into columns or rows, something that anything that you can do to make it easier for your audience to read is what you're looking for. If you have to use uh, arrows to make sure that people are going to the next spot correctly, then you've got a design problem on your poster. So try not to use arrows. As I've said, simple words are the most powerful. That is absolutely the way to convince people. Get them to understand what you're saying the first time they read it. So once you have your text, your 250 or 300 words of text, the writing center can help you. They can give you feedback and they can give you feedback either just on your text or on your whole finished poster. So the sooner you get your poster, a draft of your poster done, your supervisor will want to read it, but you can also send it to the writing center and ask them to take a look at it and give you any feedback. They don't edit. They don't, they're not an editing service, but they can give you feedback if they find uh, any particular writing things that you, that, that you're, that you're doing, that's a problem. They can help you identify them and fix them. So high recommend if you're a USASC student, send your stuff to the writing center. We also have a number of online resources through the university library. If you're having trouble 
um, summarizing or paraphrasing uh, or, or, or constructing your argument, there are a number of videos and other tutoring that the university library has done. The SURE program has also done a high number of those as well, uh, how to write an abstract, various others. And so if you look on our SURE YouTube site, you will find uh, a number of helps around those as well. So do use those online resources that are, have been made available to you. One of the big things that we see uh, at the university level is plagiarism and citations. So I have a question for the judges around ethics, and that includes citations. And citations include not just to make sure that you've got your citations at the end, just like you do in a, in a regular journal article, but also to make sure that if you're using someone else's graphic or someone else's chart or someone else's photograph, that you cite where it comes from, whether it's Creative Commons or give the reference. The, the flip side of this and the reason why this matters is that in some cases you might be doing a poster presentation that's actually going to go not just to the USAS community. So the SURE symposium is um, circumscribed in that you have to have a USAS NSID to come to the symposium. It will not be fully public. I am not creating a website to make our poster session fully public. So be reassured for that. You have to have a USASC NSID to, to be part of our poster session. And we do that specifically because in a lot of the sciences, the minute your poster is on the open internet in, on a web page, it's considered published. And some of your supervisors might have might, might be concerned about that because that might actually hurt future publication issues. And so that that's part of it. So the other thing is that posters are not peer reviewed. So the peer review process in a journal article is a little bit different. Poster sessions are not peer reviewed. The only peers who might be looking at it is if you ask your friend to read your poster for you to make sure it's understandable or you're working with your supervisor to create the poster but he's not your peer or she's not your peer um she's going to give you advice and feedback and maybe help you shape it a little bit but she she's it's not the same as peer-reviewed research so we are a little bit cautious about what goes on the internet but at the same time we still ask students to make sure that you cite all of your sources really well there are some mechanics uh, there are some differences between printing. If you are going to a physical in-person post in -person poster session, uh, the, they might have some specific uh, requests around how big you print your poster. Make sure you adhere to those guidelines. They really matter. Um, if you're presenting online, actually the size of your poster matters probably even more because they're harder to read uh, on a computer. So. Pay attention to how you're going to be presenting your poster, whether it's in person or online. You've got to know those guidelines. Whatever their guidelines are, you've got to stay within those rules. You have to, if if, if they have requirements, and we do have some requirements uh, here at, um, for the SURE Symposium, you have to both do your, if you're submitting a poster, that's great, but you have to submit it as a PDF, but you also have to do the recording as well. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. But it, it, if there are guidelines for whatever symposium or conference that you're submitting this to, make sure you're following all of their guidelines and their deadlines. So make sure you know those as well. Okay, this is sort of the last big section that I wanna talk about. This is about presenting with poise. And I originally developed this uh, when we were doing in-person poster sessions, but I realized that a lot of what I have to say here actually applies to when you're going to record yourself as well. So this is about selling your research to others. And I want you to do this. This is called the power pose. This is from Amy Cuddy. It's the Wonder Woman power pose. And before you record, and certainly before you go to a job interview or you're presenting live at a poster session, I want you to go into the bathroom and practice your power pose because that power pose that she's showing there, it gives your body confidence, it gives it strength and it gives it energy. I do it all the time before I give a presentation, whether I'm in person or online. The power pose is your number one secret. When you're presenting, you stu you always need to present an oral or prepare an oral presentation and it doesn't matter if you're in person or online you need to introduce yourself you int introduce your team and introduce your funding so make sure you put that up got a little star on that because people especially when they're recording their presentation for the sure symposium all of my recorded presentations that we've had from students it's the one thing that students forget to do and that's to introduce themselves hi my name is and then 
I work with these people and our funding comes from, and this is what we're working on. And that's what you do next. Start with the purpose of the research. Why did you do this research? And it doesn't matter if this is your recording or if you're doing it in person. If you start with the purpose of your research, it gives people that connection to you. It's like, oh, that's why you're doing this. So that larger, maybe you're researching how uh, a particular frog reacts to a particular toxin because you want to, because the larger research goal is to see if there's anything about that toxin that will help with Parkinson's or cancer or something like that. So always show that larger connection. The presentation, write out your presentation and practice it beforehand. But here's the thing, oral presentations are absolutely not the same as academic writing, not even close. An oral presentation is first person. I did this, we did that, then we did this. Simple words, um, try to get all the technical stuff and the acronyms and take them out as much as you can. So your oral presentation to explain your research is absolutely not the same as the text of your poster either. So keep that in, you're not just reading your poster. So that's the other thing. Remember to hit the highlights and your one big thing. Really, really focus in on that. Whatever your one big thing is that you want people to remember, make sure that that is crystal clear. Another thing that judges are looking for, and actually anyone within a, within a, a research community is saying, to say what you would do differently next time is number one. So if you were gonna go back and do this research again, what would you do differently? People are very interested in that because it shows your self learning process. And the next is where you'd like to go next with your research, the next logical step where you'd like to go. Those are two things that I want every student to make sure that you include. Always, always thank them for their time and invite questions and build a conversation. This works better, of course, in person, a little harder to do online. If you're doing an online live session, in some cases you might be, then that is the time to do that. Ours are going to be recorded for the SURE Symposium are going to be recorded. The judges aren't gonna have a live session. They will and they might ask you questions via email or via the chat function on, Canva, on Canvas. So you may still have to answer questions. Um, so tr do what you can to build a conversation, recognizing it's a little bit different when we're asynchronous. Okay, if you're in person, here's a few neat ideas and some extras. Some people, if you have a, a place where your larger research can be found or uh, access to the research lab or your research lab has or, or your research group has a, a website or a web page instead of doing the web page just create a qr code so that's what this is is a qr code and sometimes people will do a qr code and then that will give them sort of that extra level if if they're really interested in your research and they need to use it or they want to read it they can just take a picture of your qr code and then that'll take them exactly where they need to go and they'll appreciate that if you are live and you can do and you can bring like an iPad and maybe there's some kind of video or some extra pictures or some extra explainers that you've done, um, especially in an in-person poster session, that makes it quite a bit more dynamic and engaging. Some people will also do a handout uh, that they can hand out at a live in poster session. And, and that's a that's a high recommendation as well. People oftentimes like to have something to take away. And the last is actually, so this is just kind of a box, but but what it is is that anything 3D, some people will create a, a um, smaller version of their of whatever it is that they studied, whether it's a bug or a bird or something like that, or they want to create some kind of 3D model or animation uh, that of what they studied, those can be very effective as well. So a few neat ideas, these are extras. Um, you don't have to do them, but if they work for you, then definitely good to consider. Other ways to share your work, of course, the Sure Summer Symposium that's coming up. There's always the USSU Symposium. This coming year, it will be at the end of March. Um, it does not matter when you've done your research. So if you want to present at the Sure Symposium and then sit on it and present it again at the USSU Symposium, I would recommend it because they have a lot of prizes, cash prizes, so they're well worth it. You could also flip your research and put it into USERGE, so that's the University of Saskatchewan Undergraduate Research Journal. You can submit a paper or you can also submit a research snapshot, so if you just have something small. Also watch for disciplinary conferences or departmental conferences. So definitely, you can take the same work and share it more than once, um, Just so just keep that in mind. Or there might be different aspects 
a large research project, sometimes if you're lucky, you can get three or four posters or three or four uh, articles out of a particular piece of research. So watch for that as well. Sometimes it's about just framing different things for different audiences. Final thoughts, again, this is a circular kind of thing. Again, what I just said in that you can, whatever research you've done, oftentimes you can find ways to present it in more than one place. Um, Journalists do this all the time. They usually have big file folders of stories that they're working on, or maybe they focus on a particular area. And so then they can flip that research in different ways. If you're a magazine article writer, uh, it's always a good idea to be able to flip research for different audiences. And you might want to do the same thing. Maybe you want to write a, an op-ed piece for the sheaf. Maybe you want to write uh, a piece for the conversation, which is a, a place for academics to write, to take their stuff and write it for a public audience those that also works as well so find different ways to present your research and then you'll be reaching a, a broader audience and with that I am going to stop the recording thank you so much for being with me and then I will open it to questions and chat thanks <laughs>